Hello there, welcome back to episode 6 of my advanced tutorial series for Dwarf Fortress. In this Let's Play series, we are going to go and build this wonderful fortress together with all the explanations behind it so you can learn as much as possible from all the stuff that I'm doing here. So, last time we have finally acquired the ores that we were looking for. We have to de dig down quite quite deep for a bad and before the end of the last episode I set up a huge smelting district and we're going to have some jolly good fun with that today. So the first thing that I want to do here is I want to set up a stockpile zone and this here will be a stockpile zone exclusively for fuel. So we're going to go and store bars of coal in here. That's also storing charcoal then. So that's that. And next thing that I want to do is I want to optimize my industries here a little bit because all that hauling is not getting done fast enough for my taste. So since we are chopping tons of wood anyways, we're going to make a grand total of 20 wooden wheelbarrows. Now, wheelbarrows allow your workers to put something into the wheelbarrow and haul it around faster because those boulders, they do require quite a lot of time. So what we're going to do next, oh, we got a uh, artifact here, is we're going to assign a couple of wheelbarrows to these. So three wheelbarrows for this stockpile, three wheelbarrows for this stockpile, and uh, that's it for now. Okay, so later down the road, we will, we will do more of that. And here our artifact maker has already picked up a log and some gemstone. And if you get that has begun a mysterious construction thing, you are out in the clear and the artifact is being made. Okay, so let's check on our wood furnaces and make us some charcoal. I'll order a custom one-time order of uh, 10 times each, so we get us some stuff made here as fast as possible. So it is early autumn again, that means the caravan will hit town now yet again. That is some piece of good news because that means we can trade some. In the time between, we have found a lot of gemstone in between the different layers that we were mining and the last year was therefore quite pl plentiful and that means we can buy a lot of stuff from the upcoming caravan and if you are annoyed as me with those long um, save file settings i heard that we are allowed to change something about the way the game saves these things. I just don't know if the setting here... Yeah, compressed saves. If you turn that to no, the, the saving time is reduced. So I'm not running this game on an SSD plate and maybe you're not doing either and this can help you a bit. So charcoal making will transform one piece of log into one piece of charcoal. This is a pretty, pretty inefficient... Uh, <laughs> process altogether so we got to be careful with that but uh, as long as there's so much wood upstairs i don't really uh, i don't really mind okay we got ourselves an artifact table so you might ask yourself now what the hell are these artifacts good for so there are artifacts where i must sadly say they're almost good for nothing and there are artifacts which are certainly more useful than others. Every artifact that can be set up as a, uh, as a sort of a building is indestructible of sorts. Nobody can topple it over and destroy it. So if you ever manage to have an artifact door or hear an artifact hatch, these are in so far interesting as they are extremely resilient. Okay. So, charcoal is being made. So, now we can go and start our metal production. Next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a stockpile on here, and we're going to store all the bars of metal in here. There we go. So, our smelters will now go and grab their fuel from this stockpile, and there uh, and we'll store the finished product there it could be a tad bit better but it could be a lot worse too so 
we got the first charcoal let's get on over to the smelter and do some work in here so as you see we can now make bidon because bidon is a alloy of copper and silver tetrahedrite contains copper and silver and if you smack two boulders of tetrahedrite together you can make a lot of bilon out of that. It's a pretty uh, material efficient recipe too, with the downside that bilon is only a decorational material. You cannot make weapons or anything out of that. Bronze bars, they are, if we use the ore recipe made by smelting one tetrahedrite and one cassiterite uh, chunk together, and we will receive a weapon type material. Bronze and iron are pretty much up close even, and Therefore, you can use that stuff really, really well for your military. We can also make pewter because we got tin and copper. And uh, we also can, of course, smelt these uh, on their own. So this is the basics, what we can do here. In general, before we uh, go for these things here, in general, if you want to do anything smelting, if you can make use of an ore recipe, always do so, because these are always the most fuel efficient things. Because, you know, one boulder cont contains four bars each. So if you smelt two bars together, you use four times as much fuel as if you smelt two boulders together. Because two boulders also require only one unit of fuel. Every smelting process, one unit of fuel. It doesn't matter if you smell to large or small objects together. So, enough about that, it's caravan time. The uh, first units of bronze will be made. Ah, uh, well, let's, let's fire up a job on every single forge and head up to our trade depot. This is uh, something that we will change in the future too. I don't like where it's uh, located at, but for starters, if you are living in a safe biome, this is totally okay. So you don't need to worry about that too much. So we are going to go over to the bins menu and I am now looking for the gem bins because this is usually the one of my favorite early game trading materials. So we're going to relocate to the two gem bins that we got. And as soon as the uh, these are moved up, we're going to trade some. Right now, I am mostly looking for anvils, and if I remember correctly, I even ordered some. So I am actually quite positive about that. As you see here, my expedition leader is so hyped up, he's just making some bronze bars himself. Alrighty. So we do need a uh, broker here, though, but he's now conducting a meeting because he's the um, official, he's always going to go for the meeting with the outpost liaison, and then he's going to go for the trade. So, since we have a lot of migrants by now, let's see if we can put a different person up to the uh, broker. So, skilled appraiser. Yeah, that's good enough for me. So, um, my expedition leader doesn't have to do all the jobs himself. All right, so trader hit town. We got now a lot of items over here. So, oh, black bronze bars, <laughs> I love these. So what we are looking for here is the lignite that we ordered. As you see here, it's, uh, it's dirty cheap and it's going to yield us some coke to work with. And let's see what we can get here as well. So instruments, well, not interested in that. I am generally always uh, biased to buy booze, you know. And here, gear. In general, I like to avoid buying gear out of one simple reason. The quality matters a lot when it comes down to gear. And if you are not planning to smelt the gear down or use it because you don't have any access to any of these metals, I'd strongly recommend to just uh, make the gear yourself with a uh, sufficiently good, skilled uh, smithy. You are going to have much better gear than the stuff that you could build and buy here. So here's the stuff I was looking for. So we're going to buy you guy, your guys, uh, well, let's say three anvils. All right. Three animals should be okay. So now I'm selling off uh, what I got here. Oh boy, <laughs> that hurts. They didn't cut most of these gemstones yet. So I'm trying to sell only the 
already cut gemstones because I I gotta say selling uncut gemstones rough gemstones that's something I cannot do that hurts me too much you lose you'd lose a lot of value a lot of value. so trade the profit is now yellow let's see they're taking the uh, the trade if we'd put these uh, or as well on the table that doesn't matter we accept the counter offer we have so many gemstones down there, I don't really care. The most important thing is we got ourselves hands on some lignite. That means we can now um, refine some coke out of that. And we got ourselves a lot of anvils. That means we can now finally start work near. That's brilliant. So I'm setting up some extra bays for some extra weapon forges uh, thingies. And uh, as you see here, we're receiving tails now. That's uh, something that comes out of a tavern. Okay, so usually I'd be giving the caravan some gifts on their way, because the more you gift to your home civilization, I made the experience, the more microns will pop up at your doorstep. The more wealth you export, the more, the more um, people want to check out this place because it seems to be freaking wealthy at least that's how i understood that this system would work so we are going to keep ordering from or outpost liaison these uh, fuels i mean lignite is super low priced compacted fuel so it's a pretty good thing to uh, to to order that i'm going to order me some gold nuggets too so I can make some stuff out of gold. Let's leave it like that. It'll be dirty, to, uh, dirty, rotten, costy, but at the same time, it is an opportunity to get myself some metals that I don't have uh, easily access to here. And in general, I made the experience that if I'd order something from the outpost liaison as an ore, you always get more for your money. But uh, you gotta respect one thing ores are heavy so they're not going to bring too many of these per year just so you know Alrighty, so here we got that little district here already oh got that little room district here done so let's put in some beds put in some doors i'm already preparing myself for the next wave of immigrants because you know it is pretty cool when you can provide them a, a room to live in when they just arrive at your doorstep it's it's really comfy okay so we got some unhappiness and uh, there's a little bit of a side project that i really really like to do so first off fisher dwarves have a strong tendency to be in an ill mood because rain dwarves hate rain it's just like that but um there's also these things unmet needs be with family be with friends these are classics in the unmet needs category but there's also these prayer needs so people have the urge to express themselves religiously and uh, in this city layout that i'm running here i really like to uh, go for temples relatively early on so the temples have a similar thing going on for themselves at the taverns they need a dance floor so leave a uh, area that's at least five on five grids open so something like this here works i'm using a relatively compactified um, blueprint here because I don't want to spend too much time excavating these. We already have a lot of things that we need to excavate and a lot of jobs that need our attention. I mean, the thing here is, oh, do we have uh, do we have toys here? No, the children are playing here. <laughs> the thing here is, um, currently, it does not pay off to assign too many jobs to our fortress because the amount of workers is something that always tempts me to overburden my fortress job-wise. That's why it's also a pretty good idea if you have the wood in your biome to build some of those uh, beautiful wheelbarrows as early as possible because they really, really um, speed up things. So we got us now a pretty cool environment here. First bronze bars are ready. So we could now forge a few things if we'd actually want to. So, in other scenarios, if I'd be now seeing a larger 
um, a, a larger forge, I'd be now setting up new areas to store different ores here. But since we only have tetrahydrite and cassiterite as the only ores showing up here, I'm not going to designate a new ore zone because you know we only have these two zone, um, these own these two ore types. And as it is up here, here in the Stoneworkers District, though, we can and should make something like that happen. You see, we're working with more and more different stone types over the course of the time. So we got um, stuff that's made out of chert. We got stuff that's made out of uh, various stone types. So over the course of the time, I've made a really, really good experience with uh, bringing up uh, areas like these, where I'm starting to sort these stones. Basically, every stone type that I feature in a uh, furniture thing, like, uh, oh, wait a sec, this um, should be siltstone. And <laughs> so, for example, siltstone and... Uh, we're using siltstone, we're using chert, and we're using rock salt, if I remember correctly. Yeah, rock salt blocks. All of these stone types, they're going to receive their own respective stockpile. Because if you have it like this here, ultimately, this stockpile zone will clog up and um, your stone workers might go to the end of the world to grab the next bauxite chunk because it happens that everything here is full with everything but bauxite. So in a, in a nutshell, these uh, extra base here, they'll help us a lot. But I'm not designating them as an urgent thing right now because my mining personnel has already a lot of uh, other things to do. I love to have these huge jobs here, by the way, out of the simple reason that it keeps the miners busy with something to do, and you'd be really surprised how freaking many stone boulders you can put into a fortress if you start flooring every part, if you start building larger uh, surface structures, whatever. You can use so freaking many boulders, it's really no issue to have cut out many of them. But you might or might not notice already that there is a certain slowdown in business here. That's pretty typical for this phase of fortress building. And don't be worried if it happens to you as well. Every one of my fortresses has this uh, bit of a slump in their uh, in their in their um, efficiency when they when we're waiting for the last um, wave of uh, immigrant or for, for, for the third wave of immigrants let's call it like that so damp stone located seems like my temple plans have been foiled so you know you see there is always something coming up which might cross your plans when you're uh, designing your fortress the biggest issue here right now is that we don't manage to get the dance floor together so that is something let's see how can we fi fix that we have this in that dimension up but uh, we don't get a uh, we don't get the su a sufficient area there. Th if, if that happens, um, the best thing you can do is just uh, use the room for something different. I have something on my mind already. So we're going to go on over here to the newly found temple. And uh, as usual, I am flooring this place first. You don't need to though, you know? You can also just uh, use your rooms as they are. If you find um, constructing rock blocks in the, in, the, in the preparation just too cumbersome, and if you're impatient and you don't wanna wait, it's totally fine to not floor your buildings. Just uh, smoothen the floors and engrave them, and you also come up with a really, really high room value at the end of the day. I'm personally just a big fan of these, uh, of these, uh, of this tiled look. And also, I might have already mentioned it earlier, um, floored, uh, tiled floor is just more valuable than, than cavern floor. That's also a reason why I like to do that. Okay, enough about that. So I just dug a little bit more into that direction to see maybe we can set up a dance floor in another dimension, but uh, no. The uh, the uh, aquiferous rock is open us out on all <laughs> on all ends. Okay, whatever. We are going to designate our first temple here. So 
when it's coming down to temples, the first temple that I like to designate is usually the temple that has the most followers. So 14 worshippers for the god of death and rebirth, 14 worshippers for the god of wealth and trade, 18, 11, 18, 18. So we're going to go and uh, go for the, the gods that have the most worshippers. That's... Uh, usually um, a pretty foolproof way to make sure that you're raising the overall happiness in your fortress a tad bit with that. Because now people that have the urge to pray there can finally go and pray there. And that's uh, that's raising the morals in your, uh, in your fortress already by a lot. Religion is a very, very cheap way of... Um, of making your folks happy because the best part about religious buildings is they don't have any furniture requirements you can basically just carve out a niche call it a temple and call it a day people will go there and pray there even if there's nothing in there here i'm basically already doing a luxury variant where i'm with all the with all the flooring i'm doing but uh rest assured that it always pays off because every Every one of these zones that's uh, that's a room that people go to and, and do something at, it, it raises their happiness if it's a beautiful room. The more value there is in the room, the more positive thoughts it will provoke in the dwarves living there. So, in a nutshell, in short, it is never bad to make the environment of your fortress more valuable. Except for the fact that it attracts at some point more baddies, but uh, that's a fairly neglectable thing. If you come from uh, Rimworld, where wealth is really attracting a lot of lot of bad things, here it ain't that harsh. So uh, decorating your fortress is not being punished that hard by the game, but it has a similar mechanic that. For example, dragons and the like, they get attracted to fortresses with a higher value faster. But enough about that. So we have our first uh, temple here. I'm just waiting for those slackers to finally finish that part here. But, you know, wall engraving is totally... Uh, is totally popular among dwarves. If it bothers you, you can also assign the uh, this job to, to certain people. But I personally don't mind to have this as a mass job because the skill you develop here in this uh, by this uh, task, it's not that important in general to have that to have to, to funnel all that experience on one dwarf. Unlike, for example, with the farming, you you want to have all the experience on your farmer because the more experienced your farmer, the more yield you get out of your crops. There is no such mechanic with walls moving. The walls don't get uh, smooth and better or anything by an expert. No, that's not the case. It's just the task just gets done faster. But you might also argue that Dwarf Swarm also does the job quite fast. Do that according to your own uh, preference. I just wanted to talk a bit about how these things actually are working together. So, flooring this place as well, because I can because it's going to add to the value of this place and another monster hunter is petitioning but nope until i have prepared the underground area i'm not accepting any monster hunters and the other temple that we're setting up now is going to be for the cave of crystal because that's also a very very popular religion at our place personally i recommend you to build as many temples as there are a lot of her people worship in it. Basically, every deity that has more than 10 uh, followers in your fortress is worth dedicating a temple to because it is just good for the well being. Look at that. Already, the happiness of our dwarfs is, uh, is rising a bit by just announcing two temples. We had, I think, seven mildly uh, disgruntled dwarves already. So, yeah. That's one thing. Let's head back to the forges. I wanted to have that done just in between so we get a little bit of these jobs through. As you see here, we've made a lot of charcoal. Let's get over into the stocks menu. We haven't used that a lot yet. We're going to use it a lot more now. So we have a total, a grand total of 32 bronze bars already. You can see just uh, how efficient that is. Every one of these jobs is creating eight bars of bronze. And with eight bronze bars, we get we can get 
quite far. So every unit of charcoal is yielding eight bars of metal. So even if it might be much, much uh, more efficient to use coke, at the end of the day, if you do your smelting with ore plus ore, you can safely rely on charcoal. So don't fret, don't worry. If you don't find any lignite or bituminous coal in your environment, and as long as there's some wood available easy early on, it's it's totally okay go, to go charcoaling. And the other thing you can always fall back to, no matter if there are trees up above the ground or not, are those cavern trees. We are going to prepare ourselves for the caverns very, very soon. I just wanted to have all the industries in place before I go there. But in all honesty, all the industries are by now in place. So the only thing that I haven't set up yet that I want to set up is uh, the clothing production. You might have already noticed that I didn't do too much here. I just set up the workshops. Let's do a little bit more about this here. So first off, I want to have one stockpile zone where all the leather and all the cloth is getting stored at. Because, you know, it is always good for your workshops if you have the materials close together so people don't have a long commute to their uh, workplaces. So. What has happened with our quarry bushes? Oh, I bet I know already what has happened to our quarry bushes. So this uh, place here is not being uh, done because the plant processing is not getting done. That's because we have no bags. That's because our clothing industry isn't rolling yet. So it is a bit of a nasty chore, but it has to be done. So first off, we're going to go for the clothiers workshop, cloth bags. So cloth bags are a massively important uh, commodity in every fortress so make sure you always have a couple of these so by the way the fact that we don't have any cloth bags is the reason why the uh, quarry bushes don't get processed it does need an empty bag to process that stuff into so but that was not where i wanted to get to so my personal favorite approach is to go here into this section and now activate every one of these jobs and while I'm doing this, I'm explaining why. So the thing is, clothing deteriorates over time and deteriorated clothing makes dwarves highly unhappy. Therefore, they always need a fresh resupply of clothing. So it is my personal favorite uh, approach to just have a very, very steady resupply of clothing. Don't uh, fall for the trap. Cloth rope is not what you really need. Oh, unless you want some. So, um, shoe, sock, trousers. Yep. And my solution here looks like that. It is uh, by no means a, a super optimal uh, system, but or or a uh, or or the best system you can come up with. Let's put it more like that. But it works. So next thing you do, you go into each of these uh, thingies here, and uh, as soon as the amount of caps available is. Uh, here insert your personal uh, preferred stockpile is less than three here we say we craft some and we only do this as soon as long as we have more than uh, 10 cloth available so we don't drain our industry and make that uh, fire only once so now comes the painful part you need to do that for every one of these uh, jobs but uh, since you might already notice that there is a bit of a uh, recurring system to it it is uh, you know uh, how to put it i i use df hack for that because it has a uh, auto tailor um command which basically orders new clothing whenever the uh, whenever it is necessary but it is less reliable than the system that i'm setting up here because it clogs up your work orders with way too many um with way too many orders. Whereas this system, it will always start producing new clothing as soon as there is no more clothing of one type available anymore. And that is a pretty, pretty solid system to make sure that as soon as somebody's clothing is done for, they produce something new. So let me know how you guys handle the clothing deterioration problem. I am personally, okay with the system that I'm using here. 
but I always think like this could be better. And I'm searching for a method that doesn't blow my brains out in terms of micro, because this is already, you might see this as quite cumbersome, but in all honesty, this is now up and running. You don't need to do anything except for adjusting the numbers a little bit if you want to produce more stuff. But let's uh, end today's episode here. I think we are already on a good roll here, and I hope you guys enjoyed today's trip. We will go and deepen our our businesses here in the upcoming episodes. I think in the next episode I will start preparing the uh, the cavern breach a little bit. We might be also preparing us some gear for fighters. Because you see, we, we got now everything we require. We got bronze and uh, we got anvils. All we require are now weapons and the like. So, thanks for watching everybody. Next time we got brilliant things up ahead of us. Leave me a comment down below. Leave me questions about whatever or I really love to hear from you folks. Leave a thumbs up on that video for the algorithm to make it more visible for everybody else and consider subscribing if you want to help out this channel. This is one of the most easy and cheap ways to do so. And if you want to be notified when new stuff of my side is coming on up, just hit that bell button. Playlist links down there lead you to this series. If you are new to this series, episode one is down there or episodes uh, or episodes of my beginner's tutorial series, which is uh, taking the whole thing from a uh, much less organized perspective and a more of a uh, dive into perspective and a playlist for all those small tutorials. If you felt like this was way too much talking and you want to have things summarized quicker. Be that as it may, thanks for still hanging around, thanks for watching that ad roll at the very end. This is extraordinarily nice of you, and have a wonderful day.